you might be wondering, how, how come if we're studying the return of the king in Revelation 6 through 20, why are we in 2 Peter? It's because it's the missing link. Uh, the, the book of Revelation goes from the tribulation to the new heavens and the new earth with the millennium between. And it never says what happens. It never says how you go from half of all the people on the earth dying and this huge rebellion at the end of the millennium and all that to the new heavens and new earth. And Peter is the only one that really explains that in 2 Peter 3. And he talks about everything is going to be dissolved. But that, that's really not what we're looking for. He follows up with because everything is going to be dissolved this is how you should live today. See, that, that's how Peter was. Sometimes Paul is, you know, stratospheric. Peter was a fisherman. And Peter wants to explain to us the implications of everything being destroyed with fire and what that should mean to our daily lives. So number one, these are Peter's last days. As we're going to chapter three, remember Peter was a normal person with all the struggles and everything that all of us go through in life. I can still see him in my mind after being a fisherman so many years. He probably had gnarled hands from all the cuts that he got from the line. And, and he probably still had that leathery skin, you know, that people that spend too much time in the sun or the sun huts, you know, get. You know, you can see that when they've been overexposed to the sun. But what probably you would have noticed in Peter in his last days were those eyes of his. Now, I've been a teacher. I, I taught high school and I taught uh, seminary. I've taught a lot of different, I was a high school youth pastor. I can, after a little while of talking to a group of people, you know, you just look at all of them and you just look at their eyes. And you can pick out in every crowd those bright-eyed, mischievous ones. You know, if you give them even an inch, that they're going to start being mischievous. That's what Peter was like. I mean, some commentators have called him the apostle with the foot-shaped mouth. I mean, he always spoke before he thought. He was so excited. In fact, remember, Jesus had, had initially brought Peter aboard with two words. And Peter never forgot those two words. Jesus said to him, follow me. And Peter did that to his dying day. I can just see in my mind as Jesus is walking along and teaching in the hillsides, Peter's looking up at the hillsides and bumping into Christ because he always was following as close as he could get. And Peter was like that to the end of his life. Well, in 2 Peter... He's addressing a group of people that were living, as we saw two weeks ago in the Power Outage Sunday, that were living at what I call the epicenter of the Roman Empire. It was the, if, if there was any part of Rome that was Roman, it was where they were, which is modern-day Turkey. It was Asia Minor. And they lived in a place where the empire's greatness was clearly seen. The, the temples, some of them are still around today that, that you can see. And they had columns that were 10 stories high. Now, this ceiling might be about three and a half stories high. Imagine columns that went up three heights of this building. And imagine going through buildings with forests of those columns, where you just, all you could see were 100 foot high columns and 60 foot high columns and, and all the intricate carvings in them. And then you went from there to from the, the temples of Rome, you'd go into the Roman baths. This summer, last July, I took a group from, from Calvary to see one of the largest of all the Roman baths that's still there. You can go inside of it. It was so big, you could take our Portage Mall and take both levels and flatten it out, and it would still be, uh, the bath was larger than our whole mall. It could fit 3,000 people all at once, taking either a hot, a warm, or a cold bath and all the attending rooms that went with it. But you'd go from there to, to other structures, to crowded stadiums that would hold a, a, you know, tens of thousands of people, or you would go to, the, to the, the theaters. You talk about acoustics. I was looking up while we were singing at all this array of stuff we have here. Did you know, for example, one theater in Epidaurus, it's in Greece. You can go there today, Epidaurus, Greece. You can stand on a little platform like this, and there are 25,000 seats. 
And I, I take groups there, and I go up to the edge platform, and I, I have them all sit in the very top row, and I say, can you hear me? Can you hear me up there? You don't even have to raise your voice. And all of them on the top row are shaking their heads because the acoustical engineering of the Roman Empire was unparalleled. And so was their aquatic engineering with their miles of aqueduct. And so was all of their engineering. And in the midst of that had arisen an emperor that noticed in his sights the Christians. And his name was Nero. And he had started sporadically persecuting them so that the people felt like they were in the tribulation. You know, throughout all history, people have felt like that. But these people especially felt like the emperor was the Antichrist and the Roman Empire was the, the one that talked about in the Bible and that, that they were in the tribulation. So what do you write to people when it feels like you're at the end? And, and that's, that's what's going on. When it feels like the end is near, Peter begins to write this epistle to those early believers in Asia Minor. And I'm sure that some that got this letter were convinced that they were in the book of Revelation. But first, Peter's first epistle comforted them about the fiery trials, but now where we're going to read this morning in 2 Peter 3, and we're only going to read verses 10 and 11, what Peter is doing is he's laying out for them the way that you live in light of the truth you're already aware of. For example, you know, you've heard of insider trading and people that sell their stock before the announcement's made where everybody sells their stock, but you sell it for full price and they're all in the stampede as it's dropping. And you know, of course, what was it? Martha Stewart went to jail for doing that. You know, insider trading is, insider knowledge is priceless. Peter is giving insider knowledge to these people that are living in this highly civilized, highly material uh, driven culture. He says, I want to tell you something. And he writes these words. So you have your Bibles open, 2 Peter chapter 3. We're going to read verses 10 and 11. But I don't want to remind you too often, but I want to remind you often that every time you open this book, whether you're alone in your quiet time or you're sitting here or you're in a Bible study, whenever you open the Bible, the Bible is God's word. That means it's God talking. All of it. He inspired the whole thing. And so anytime we either read it or hear it read, you're actually hearing what God has to say on something. And this is what God has to say when you think you're near the end. This is how you're supposed to live. So uh, chapter 3, verses 10, 11, let's stand together for the reading of God's word. Remain standing, we'll pray, and we'll ask the Lord to just open our hearts that we'll respond to his word. But the day of the Lord, verse 10 says, will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? And that starts his list of how to live. So this morning, the first truth we're going to look at is Peter saying, when you live in the midst of something as impressive as the Roman Empire, but you know that everything is going to be, verse 11, dissolved, and verse 10, going to melt and burn up. How should you live? Does God have anything to say about how you live in a highly advanced, civilized, very engineered society? Which kind of sounds like where we live today. And that's how powerful the Word of God is. Let's bow before him in prayer. Father, I pray that on this Communion Sunday, our hearts will be open and receptive to Peter at the end of his life, talking to a group of people that were also, at the end of their lives, persecuted to death, some of them. And as a dying man filled with such love for you, Peter writes your word. And I pray that we'd hear what you have to say this morning and that you would change us by the power of your spirit. Meet us right where we are, as you always do. There are some deeply burdened members of your family here today. And I pray that they would hear your voice through the fog of what they're going through and their struggles that, that are so paralyzing their lives. And we ask you to be glorified as you change us today. In Jesus' name, amen. 
may be seated. As you're seated, I want you to think for a moment about the fact that the Bible wasn't written in a vacuum. I mean, to write words like this, think about these people that were getting this letter. Think about what was going on in their minds. It was very much so that the believers of Asia Minor were feeling like they were going through the horrors that the Bible talks about at the end times. Because their emperor was, was worshipped as a god, had, had the absolute authority of the mightiest empire on earth at his beck and call. Now, you know what's interesting, and, and uh, I'm going to answer that tonight, but someone asked, they said, do you think that there's only one Antichrist? I said, no, no. I believe Satan has had his nominee for the Antichrist in the wings in every generation. I think that, that Nero, probably Satan thought he was going to be the one. Hitler, probably Satan really was worked up over Hitler because Hitler was, was worshipped by the masses, mesmerizing when he talked, just like the Antichrist will be, and he was killing the Jews. I mean, Satan just had it all at once. He was so excited. But I think that he always has his candidate. And, and someone said, do you think the Antichrist is alive today? You bet. There's been one in the line always alive. But only God knows when that moment comes that is the true end. And Satan will push forward his person then. But notice with me that Peter, and I want you to back up to 1 Peter 4, because, because these people... You're in Second Peter. Go back to First Peter 4. Number one, first century believers were facing horrible tortures. And by the way, everybody since the first century has gone through horrible tortures. And so the tribulation is going to be worse than the most horrible tortures anybody's ever gone through. And so everybody has always thought they were at the end. And we also believe that we're in the last days for other reasons, not because we're very much tortured in America. But first century believers faced horrible tortures. Look at verse 12 of First Peter 4. Peter said, Beloved... Don't think it strange concerning the fire trials, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. Now that phrase, fiery trials in verse 12, it could also read, if you, if you read it in the amplified form, where it puts the words, the Greek words in their order and, and emphasizes them the way it does syntactically, it would read like this, the painful trial that burns among you. Now that helps us understand more what's going on. Because where is Peter writing this from? Most commentators would say that Peter, because it says that he wrote from Babylon, either was in Iraq with the Jewish encampment, the, the people that had lived there after the exile, or most likely Babylon is referring, as Revelation does, to Rome. As, as being kind of like Babylon, uh, you know, reformed with all of its mystery religions. But wherever, Peter does end up in Rome. He's killed there. And so sometime in his career, he's through that city, and he knew what Nero was doing. And what Nero was doing was amazing. The followers of Jesus in the city of Rome, most likely where Peter had lived and probably wrote this letter, were being dragged from their families and dipped in tar. Now, when the winter's over and all those potholes were hitting, are filled, and you get behind one of those big public service trucks, you know, where they have the boom on it, and they come over, and they, they have hot tar, and they squirt it in there, and then they shovel, you know, gravel on it, and they tamp it down. Think of a vat of hot tar, and imagine your wife or your daughter or you or your son being dragged out of the house, tied up, dipped in tar up to your shoulders, coated like chocolate, tied to a telephone pole and put into a garden to be burned alive that night at the emperor's banquet. That's what Nero did. In fact, this summer, if you've ever seen the Colosseum and all the pictures of Rome, the Colosseum wasn't around. Nero didn't build the Colosseum. He didn't kill Christians in the Colosseum. It was a Flavian amphitheater. It was 17 years after his death. That was a lake where the Colosseum is now. That was the lake of Nero's palace. And his house was just set up the hill from the lake. And all the way down the hill to the lake where the Colosseum is, he put these Christians on stakes dipped in tar. Now that, look back at verse 12. If you were reading this in the first century and say, yeah, I think it's strange. I don't like fiery trials that are trying us. Peter says, don't think they're strange. Because, and, and keep reading, look at verse 13. Because the second 
you know, Peter's describing experiences of pain comparable with the pain of being burned with fire. That's his definition. But look what he says in verse 13. First century believers not only face these horrible tortures, but they experience divine comfort. See, what I want to get to this morning is, how do you have lives like this, that you can be dipped in tar and burned alive and you're still staying with it and not aborting the mission and saying, I'm not a Christian anymore? What made these people so receptive to the Lord? Well, look what he says in verse 13. But rejoice to the extent you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. Our suffering is the same kind of thing that Christ received, and therefore, in a sense, our suffering is an indication of our identification with Christ, is what he's saying. When we suffer for Christ's sake, we're suffering like Christ suffered, and we're identifying with him. But he doesn't stop there. Uh, it's interesting, he says, to the extent that you partake. See that in verse 13? That's, that's the old word we all know, koinonia. That means we're in partnership, we're in fellowship, we're, we're, we're partnering with Christ when we suffer. We share in fellowship with him. But, but look at the end of, of the 13th verse. Peter says, we have this exceeding joy. Now what is he talking about? Well, biblical joy at its deepest sense is rooted in trusting God. It's not attached to circumstances. See, we are so shallow nowadays. We're happy when everything's going well, and we're not happy when everything's not going well. But, uh, and that's human. But a believer detaches from their circumstance and has joy. See, that's, that's what he's saying. You have exceeding joy when you're dipped in tar. You have exceeding joy when you're burned alive. You have exceeding joy when it's your wife or mother or sister or daughter or son that had that happen. It's not you're happy. You have joy. And joy is the evidence of the Spirit of God living within us. It's the evidence that the Holy Spirit has moved in because it's unnatural. It's, un, it's, it's not normal to have joy in suffering. And so Peter says, you have exceeding joy because in the deepest sense, it's a profound confidence God is in control of everything in our lives, even the painful places. So look down at verse 19. Here's the third underlying truth of what Peter's writing. Number one, they faced horrible torture. Number two, they had divine comfort. But look at verse 19. First century believers knew God allows no accidents. You know, we hear people say, oh, they were involved in an unfortunate accident. Yeah, that's how we would look at it. God allows no accidents accidents. What's an accident? It's when you're texting and not looking at the road. Do you think God is confused and texting and not looking at the road and he allows Christians to crash? See, God doesn't allow accidents. Therefore, verse 19, 1 Peter 4, 19, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. And what he's saying is that God doesn't allow accidents and if you if you keep your life in sync with God, that you can just have this exceeding great joy no matter what happens because he doesn't allow any accidents to penetrate your life. That's why we have to daily renew our surrender to God. In fact, the word in verse 19 that Peter used, translated commit, means entrusting for safekeeping. We're supposed to entrust our lives to God for safekeeping. You know, it's so sweet when you have children, when they're little. I can remember whatever was precious to them, if they were going to the playground, they would run toward the playground. Then they'd stop and they'd turn around and they'd take whatever it was, you know, that was their marbles or their favorite, you know, whatever, that they didn't want something to happen to. And they'd come back and they would entrust it for safekeeping to me because they knew I wouldn't get on the monkey bars, you know. And so they knew that I would take care of their stuff. Did you know that's what this verse says? Commit yourselves to the Lord. Entrust yourself to him for self-keeping, uh, for safekeeping of you and of your life. And basically what Peter's saying, look at the end, a faithful creator. I mean, if God can keep all the countless galaxies, not only the galaxies, but every star in them named and numbered and, and synced with his plan, and if he can keep all the ebbing of the ocean tides around this planet going, certainly he can be counted on to keep track of our lives. See, see, he says, think of him as who he is. He's the, the faithful creator. Well, what he's saying is, God is personally able to walk me through any trial I'll ever face in my lifetime 
which is what takes us to Second Peter. So that was, that's, in fact, verse 19 is a summary of, First Peter 4.19 is a summary of all of First Peter. He kind of summarizes it in one verse. But now go to Second Peter chapter 3. I just wanted you to know the backdrop because what happened is things didn't get better for those early believers. You know, the ones dipped in tar and burned. It didn't stop. It didn't get better. In fact, succeeding emperors were going to get worse and worse in their focused persecution of the Christians. And so since things weren't getting any better, things were getting worse. And with all the hardships in mind they faced, Peter is writing to them a second and final time. They were suffering. They were losing their freedom. They were losing their security on earth. For some, they were even losing their lives. And so Peter gives them a lesson. And this is what we're getting into. And this just fits right in with Revelation. And what Peter is doing in 2 Peter 3 is giving them lessons about how you keep your legacy from being destroyed. Because they didn't know how long their life was going to be. In other words, how do you build a destruction-proof legacy? We could summarize what Peter was saying by saying he was exhorting his loved ones in how to rescue their treasures from the flood that was coming. What was the flood coming? It's a flood of fire. God is going to burn up everything. And if you want to not have, as 1 Corinthians 3.10 says, suffering loss as we stand in front of the judgment seat of Christ, Peter's saying, make sure that you preserve your legacy, your life that you live on earth, preserve it from being burned up in the end. You say, what was he talking about? Well, look back at verse 10 and 11, because what he's saying, and, and I can summarize the first lesson he gives, to save your legacy. You know, a lot of people have their portfolios, and they have all these, you know, on the computer you can program to sell your stuff when it covers this price or moves this fast or this percent. You have all this. People are always, you know, trying to guard their, their portfolio. The Lord says you ought to be guarding your life so that when your life is over, what you live for doesn't get erased. It doesn't get thrown in the dumpster. So how do you do that? Well, he says this. Number one, verses 10 and 11. This is probably the, one of the biggest ideas of the New Testament. This is what Jesus talked about all the way through the Gospels is what Paul talks about all the way through his epistles. Now, this is what Peter's talking about, and Jude talks about, and James talks about it, and John talks about it. So, I mean, it's kind of universal. This is what he says, beware of materialism. Let me show you what I mean. Look at verse 10. If you look back at the words, uh, starting in verse 10, Peter says that the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night, and the heavens are going to pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat, and the earth and the works in it are going to be burned up. What he says is everything is going to be burned up. Now look at verse 11. Therefore, since everything is going to be dissolved, how should you live? Well, you know what the simple, do you know what the first grader would say? Well, if everything's going to get burned up, I shouldn't live for the stuff that's going to get burned up. And you say, bingo, you got it. See, materialism is living for what's going to be burned up by God. And Peter says, beware, you're not living for what God's going to burn up. We must not find our joy in what God says we are going to lose in the end. He says, don't live for what's going to be taken away from you. We should not find our joy in things. You notice what it says in verse 11? All these things will be dissolved. Don't put your joy in something that's going to be dissolved. Do you know how disheartening it is if you're holding on to something and God has to pry it out of your hands and blow it up? It's like, you shouldn't have that. He's going to dissolve it. We should not have our satisfaction in things. Now, I was telling the first service, I hate to date myself, but I can remember one of the last songs I ever heard on the radio. I had this old 1965 F-85 Oldsmobile, or maybe it was a 62, I don't remember, but I was driving around, and I remember the radio playing, forget all your troubles that are getting you down, because you can always go where? Downtown and shop right? It was the start of the mall culture. And we all, if we felt bad, we'd go prowl the mall and buy something we don't need with money we didn't have, you know, and we would feel better. Well, what he's saying is, don't find your satisfaction in things. Don't hope in things. That is materialism. Materialism is living for material things. In fact, God describes materialism in his word as covetousness. You ever heard the word covetousness? He, he calls it greed, and he also calls it 
possessiveness or selfishness. And those things are always negative. Greed is an attitude that gets demonstrated by the action of possessiveness. That means I think that everything I have belongs to me. God says nothing you have belongs to you. It all belongs to me. What have you that you have not received? Why do you act like you didn't receive it? Why do you act like it's yours? Possessiveness and selfishness is me saying, it's my money, it's my time, it's my body, it's my life. God says it's not. Even if you're not saved, it's not yours. He's the creator. He owns all. And we need to think about possessiveness is, is the idea that what we have is ours. And then that, that's, by the way, is an action. An attitude is covetousness. That's even worse. Covetousness is longing for what we don't have. It's longing with an intense desire for what I don't have. And I want it so bad, it's on my mind all the time. And I'm planning and scheming and I'm willing to sacrifice and I'm willing to change and, and, and trample over almost anyone or anything to get something I want. Kind of reminds me, I mean, did you watch the Thanksgiving videos of the poor people beating each other up to get $5 items at Walmart somewhere in Texas or Florida? I mean, we wouldn't do that in Michigan, but you know what I mean. And they just burst through the doors and, and their people are trampled and they're all digging and, and they're tearing off the pallet. This, I mean, they, they were still bringing stuff in with a fork truck and the people were just ripping it off of there. That's covetousness. Now, none of us are like that, right? See, it's, it's part of the very fabric of our lives. We, we're not like the people at Walmart, but we do often live for things. Well, I want to emphasize covetousness or coveting is an internal longing for what we don't have. And, and for just a minute, look at Colossians chapter 3. I want to show you. I mean, this is, this is cover to cover. Uh, New Testament, front and center, constantly talked about this material longing that we have. But look what Paul says. He equates materialism with idol worship. And he says these strong words in Colossians 3, 5. Therefore, put to death. These things are so bad, give them no mercy. Don't let any part of this be going on in your life as believers. And we would agree with fornication, sexual sin, that's bad. Uncleanness, yeah, that's bad. Passion, you know, this unbridled, uh, you know, uh, passionate, no, no, that's bad. Evil desires, yeah, that's weird. Those people are, are you know, they're, they're bad. Covetousness? Well, that's the essence of the American culture. You need white tur teeth. You need thinner everything. You know what I mean? You need newer, stronger faster it's comparative degree we're always we're always wishing for something we don't have and look what paul says covetousness which is idolatry well real quickly let me just what paul's saying is longing for things is idolatry that's the bottom line longing for things is idolatry now let's let's put this in the 21st century terms real quickly uh, go back to Exodus, and we're going to end here before communion, and this is where we're going to pick up, Lord willing, next week. Go back to Exodus. You all had to learn the Ten Commandments, right? When you were little in Sunday school or maybe in school, you learned the Ten Commandments. Let's look at the Tenth Commandment of the Ten. And, and I want you with me to define what is materialism or coveting in 21st century terms, okay? Let's, let's take the, the eternal changeless God's declaration that we are not to covet. And let's see if we covet, okay? And I'm just going to cover this very quickly. Five minutes, then we're going to go into communion, okay? The tenth of the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verse 17. If you look at it closely, there are six groupings of things. There, there are actually seven statements, but two of them are, are merged together. So there's six little areas. He says, watch out, you don't covet in these areas. Number one, he says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You know what that means? Let's put that in 2013. What does that mean? It means do not long for a bigger, a better, a more beautiful, a more spacious, a more comfortable house that you've seen and don't have. Well, why we're all supposed to do that. We're all supposed to be trying to better ourselves and move up in the world and have something better and make something of ourselves. If it involves longing for something you don't have, God has already defined that as idolatry. 
an, an intense longing that I will get as many jobs and I will, I will do whatever it takes and never see my children and I will work 18 hours a day because I want to get that property and build the dream house is an idol, according to God. Now, it's not to our society. Probably this is the most acceptable sin in the church. We all go, yeah, I mean, you know, we can entertain people. Well, the Bible says you're supposed to entertain strangers, not your friends. And strangers aren't impressed if they don't know that you have a bigger and better. And, and part of our hospitality is we're guarding the, the house that we long for. But it doesn't stop there. That, that's amazing. It says don't wish for it, don't get a second job to earn more money for it, and don't spend all your time looking for it because that's idolatry. But look at the next one. And by the way, did, did you know what the, the solution to this is? God calls it contentment. He says, do you know the liberating power of being content with where you live? It gives you so much extra time to serve me and seek me and know me if you're not insatiably always jumping to the next. But secondly, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Men, that means you don't long for all the externally looking prettier and skinnier and younger women that you've noticed in life. And women, that means you don't long for the stronger, handsomer, kinder, more caring, and more athletic, and more in shape men that you've noticed along the way. And it means you don't wish you had one like the ones you see at work or read about. And you don't wish you had the ones like you see on TV or in movies or online. And you don't wish that your wife looked like a gymnast or a cheerleader or an actress model. And you certainly don't wish that your husband looked like an athlete or a movie star or a model because that's idolatry. Boy, that is our culture. Everyone doesn't like how they are. They want to be somebody else. They want to look like somebody else. They, want to, they just want someone else. We should be content with the husband or wife God has given us and use our extra time to serve our wife or our husband and our children instead of longing for a better marriage partner. You know what Peter said? If you're married to an old stick in the mud, don't push the Lord down their throat. Just live so Christ-like that they can't resist you. Even Christ's enemies couldn't resist him. They said, hey, he's so kind. The way he talks, nobody else talks like him. The Lord says, that's how you, you don't tell them, go to the gym, you know, take a, you know, grooming course. No. Look at number three. <laughs> Verse 17, you shall not covet. Now, see, all of us say this. Maybe the first two we could relate to. This one, don't covet your neighbor's male servant or female servant. We don't have those anymore, right? No. You know, what was that about? Oh, you're living in a tent and you're going out to take care of your animals in the field and everything in Israel and you notice your neighbor is laid on a couch and people are fanning him and dropping grapes in his mouth and you go, I wish I had male and female servants and didn't have to go out to the field. So how do you put that in 21st century? Don't long for a more comfortable life with less hard work, with less struggles and cares and more free time to do what you please like all the rich and famous you've watched and heard about because that's idolatry. That, no, that's, that's how we're wired. We want everybody else's maid servants and, uh, you know, and male servants. God says, be content in the place in life where I put you. Use your extra time to live more every day for my glory and surrender to my will. But he doesn't stop there. Look at the next one. Don't covet your neighbor's ox. Now we say, hands down, I've never done that. What was an ox? It was the plow animal for his job. They were agrarian. This is, he had a bigger tractor is how we would put it nowadays. Don't long for that dream job that everyone else has and all the freedom and all the perks and all the security and the high pay like you've seen or heard about because that's idolatry. Be content with what God has placed into your hands to do for him. Trust him to guide your path and use all your extra time to stay tuned into him and follow his leading and you'll have the best job in life that it's possible to have. You know, it's amazing how much of our energy we spend because we're coveting and idolatrous about what we think everybody else has. And God said, if you just be content with what I gave you, you can't contain how, how much I'll bless you. But we forfeit that. And then it says, here's the next one, you shall not covet your neighbor's donkey. 
That's his transportation, by the way. So you know what that means? Don't wish you had a car or a truck or a boat or a bike or a motorhome or a snowmobile, etc., like everybody else has, that's bigger, that's newer, that's fancier, that's sportier, that's more powerful and impressive. Why? Because that's idolatry. And yet, that's a sales... I mean, I was a salesman for years. You know how they motivate us? <laughs> you get the better company car. We're giving away Infinity 5s next year if you get those numbers up, you know? And we just covet and it becomes an idol. God says, be content with what you have and thank God for all the struggles your car gives you because that's what God uses to increase your faith and your patience and your dependence on him and use all your extra time and energy you save by not trying to impress everyone around you to start spending more time pleasing God. And then if we didn't get it, look at the end of the verse, verse 17. Don't covet anything that's your neighbor's. God says, don't long for anything you don't have that someone else has because that's idolatry. How did those people live such incredible lives? It's because they were very careful to not be materialistic. The Lord was more important to them than their job. The Lord was more important to them than their house, than what they look like, than how much they had. Because they said, what I have isn't mine anyway, it's the Lord's, and however much he lets me use for his glory is great. But I'm not going to live my life selfishly, possessively, saying it's mine. That's what unleashed for them the powerful lives they had. They were just like us. They had all the struggles. Stuff still hurt back then, still was hard to live. But they were not materialistic like I might say we very much are today. So maybe, and this is where we're going to pick up next week, Lord willing, maybe this could be the communion where, like in our first song this morning, we're going to start thinking about being before the throne and how God wants us to operate on earth, getting ready for there. Let's bow before him, and as the men are going to go and prepare to serve us communion, let's just start focusing our hearts on where we're headed before the throne of God. And our accountability is, Lord, how's my life going to look when I stand in front of you? Are you going to see I was living for things or for you? Was I coveting for everything I didn't have? Or was I overwhelmingly grateful for what you gave me? Father in heaven, I thank you with hearts bowed before you. I thank you for the paradigm you told us that we're to structure our lives around. It was that little prayer that every day we're to direct our hearts toward you, our Father, who are in heaven sitting on that throne. And we're supposed to say that everything I do today, I want to hallow your name. I want it to, to magnify who you are. And I want people to see that that I am not living for this world. I'm living for the world to come. That my citizenship is in heaven. That I have a building in heaven not made with hands that is not going to be shaken and dissolved and burned. And that I have a king, another king that's not of this world. That I march to his orders. Not, my life is not attached to this world. And you said that the way we do that is to, to ask you to give us this day our daily bread, that we were going to live in dependence on you, not salting away and socking away and, and amassing so much that our hearts grow cold. But we're going to say it's all yours. It's not ours. And we don't want to be a slave to anything but to you as our master. Lord, there's much that we need to talk with you about at this communion. And I pray through the words of these songs and through the actual emotions of the bread and the cup that we offer to you, that inside we'll offer ourselves to you and that we will be those who are detached from living and longing for things starting today by your grace. Thank you for the bread. Thank you you gave yourself for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, an idol is anything that displaces God from his rightful place in our life. I know many people that you could easily say their job has displaced the Lord. I mean, their whole life is built around their job. And the Lord, who knows where he is. Or their sports have displaced the Lord. Their acquisition of riches display all those things are idols 
And the Lord says that at communion, it's a time when we say, whoa, you actually gave your body to purchase me. I belong to you. And I'm a runaway slave. I'm not serving you. I'm serving the world, my pursuits, my acquisitions. And so communion is where we say, Lord, I want to reset back. I want to live every life accountable to you, my real master, that I'm going to stand in front of someday. See, the, the first century people really believed all this, and so they really did change their earthly lives because of where they were headed. People nowadays kind of believe it, but they don't change their earthly lives because they don't really have a conviction that's where they're headed. And so the Lord said communion is where reality comes in. And what we say is, Jesus said, this is my body which is given for you, and when you partake of it, remember me. Let's do that together. And Lord, we're so painfully aware of how far short we fall from what your word says, of what we know pleases you, and we get so far away from you. But Lord, your word has told us that no matter how many steps, one, ten, or a thousand steps, we have taken away from you, it's always only one step back. And that is if we confess, if we agree with you about our sin and, and repent of that sin and say, Lord, I have allowed that to displace you, that you're faithful and just, to already have forgiven us and to cleanse us so we can enjoy the unhindered access to your presence and your glory and your satisfaction. So at this communion, I pray that this would be a time of renewal, rededication, consecration, surrender. And that we would just put everything on the table and say, Lord, my job, my pursuits, my hobbies, my material possessions, I just put them before you. They are not mine. They're yours. Now, how would you have me to live from this point onward? I pray that you would shake us up and get a hold of us and help us to live every day for you. In the name of Jesus, we pray that. Amen. The men are going to pass the cup, and uh, John Altoff, bless his heart, picked my favorite hymn for this next one. So let's sing it to the Lord this morning. If you can stand without knocking anything over, let's all stand up, and we're going to, to think about the implications, because someday we're going to stand before the throne of the Lord. And when we think about him who died in my place, do you know what Revelation 4 said? We studied that many weeks back. When we, when we remember the one that died in our place, we fall flat on our faces before him. Now, don't do that this morning, but that is what we're going to do. And in our hearts, we can fall flat as we surrender and we say, we want to live for you. Let's sing it to him. Now, someone asked me if I was going to meddle. Now, I don't meddle. I would just say this. Do you think the holy God of the universe would be most glorified in your life watching a bunch of half-dressed young ladies shaking themselves in front of the cameras and watching all the parade of commercials that Wall Street Journal has already said, use the restroom during the game, don't miss a single commercial. Do you think that is the way to most glorify God on the night that his church gathers? So I'm not going to meddle at all. What I'm going to say is, <laughs> this cup is the new covenant that purchased us to honor the Lord in every dimension of our life and not say there's one day of the year you can't expect. No, every day belongs to him. None of them are mine. That's what this cup means. I'm glad that the Lord is so clear. And he said, do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. And dear Father in heaven, I pray for anyone that maybe this morning needs to have your word opened and someone to just encourage them. Maybe there's someone here that doesn't even know you and they need to be led to you. I pray that at the end of the service as the elders and our Titus two women are here, 
with your word in hand, that you draw them to yourself, bring them, and help us to be able to minister to them. And then, Father, I pray that we would remember you a moment longer than this service, that what we heard today from Exodus 2017 just would gnaw away at our priorities and that we would see how much of our life is consumed with longing for what we don't have rather than loving you that we do have. And I pray we'd be consumed with a passion to please you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you. you should go.